Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mikko Stranbori. I'll be talking about Vario VR1 and XR1 and how to use them with Unity. Um, I joined Vario uh, March of this year. Uh, before that, I spent the previous six years at Unity writing various graphics low-level uh, backends such as the Vulkan renderer and OpenGL renderer and some of the shader compilers. So on today's agenda, I'll introduce our company and the hardware we do. Uh, we'll dive into what it means to render at human eye resolution. Then Unity integration, how it works, how to use it, and then some best practices for creating content for our headsets. After that, it's time for a live demo and hopefully some time left for questions. Vario is a three-year-old company based in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, we have offices also in LA and Washington, DC. Uh, we are currently at over 150 employees, and our first headset was launched earlier this year. It's called Vario VR1. Uh, it's a headset targeted for professional markets, and it's a first of its kind. So, why Vario? What are the problems this company is trying to solve? In short, in its current state, neither VR or AR are good enough for serious use yet. The current high-end VR headsets have insufficient resolution for demanding use cases. Both Valve Index and Oculus Rift S have something like 15 pixels per degree of resolution. The human eye, 60 PPD at the fovea. <laughs> Secondly, while the headsets do come with cameras, uh, the latency of photons to photons is way too high for any actual real-world use. It just causes nausea. There is also another class of AR devices, uh, namely the ones that draw holographs on top of the user's normal vision, such as the HoloLens and Magic Leap. Uh, the problem with them is that you can only add light to the scene. You cannot remove light. Let's tackle the resolution problem first. Uh, this diagram presents the resolution accuracy of the human eye. Uh, you can see the eye is super sharp right at the fovea, but the resolution drops sharply when you go towards the edges. Current generation VR headsets are somewhere around here. Uh, that is fine for the peripheral vision, but as you can see from the chart, it's pretty far from what the eye can actually see. Uh, to put things into perspective, if your eyesight was on this level, you wouldn't be able to drive a car. You'd be legally blind. OK, so why don't we just render everything at the 1.0 level there? First of all, there is no display hardware that is capable of such resolutions. Also, current generation GPUs would have to render uh, something like 35 megapixels per, uh, per frame at 90 hertz. And no GPU can do that, not for several, several years. So let's add various solution to the chart. Well, this is what we did with VR1. Oh, doesn't work. There we are. Uh, as you can see, the VR1 can do full human eye resolution right at the fovea. Uh, it's with the focus display. It's 30 degrees field of view. Outside that, we have what we call context display, which is similar to other high-end HMDs. How do we achieve this? We have two separate displays for each eye. The context display, the large one, is 1600 by, uh, 1400 by 1600 AMOLED. And the focus display is 1080p micro OLED. Uh, we use an optical combiner, essentially a mirror, to generate the final image. This is what it looks like on the inside. We have Steam VR tracking, uh, automatic uh, interpupillary distance control, and integrated gaze tracking. By the way, the gaze tracking is so accurate that it can, uh, its accuracy is a sub-degree, which means that you'd be looking at features that are about the size of your fingernail at arm's length. This product is aimed at professional markets, so the price tag is something like $6,000. Uh, 
Blending two displays presents quite a unique challenge for us. Uh, the two displays need to blend into each other seamlessly, otherwise the illusion of reality really breaks down. In essence, we have two displays on top of each other, uh, is essentially additive to each other, and we need to match their characteristics. The displays are really quite different. They are One is AMOLED and the other is Micro OLED, and they have different brightness, contrast, color reproduction, and response times. Here are some of the things we do to match the displays. Each unique device that hits the store shelves is calibrated in the factory production line using a specialized camera and a testing pattern. From that camera image, we calculate lens correction, color aberration, and color reproduction data and store it in the firmware of that specific device. And then at runtime, we fetch those calibration values and, and the compositor uses them to produce the optimal image reproduction for each unique device. While the calibration helps with aberration and color reproduction, we're still left with differences in display contrast and response times. And here we apply our secret sauce. This starts with the realization that the two displays are essentially additive. The context display has pixels underneath the focus display, and we can use that fact to our advantage. So each context display pixel covers the area of approximately four by four pixels in the focus display. What if we treated those pixels, those large pixels, as a sort of a very accurate full color backlighting? So the algorithm we use looks something like this. So for each context display large pixel area, we take those four by four pixels in the focus region, and for each color component, we find the minimum color value for each one because the focus display cannot render negative colors. We find those, that minimum color value for each 4x4 area, use that color as the context display pixel, and then in the focus display we render the remainder. So this way the result looks seamless across both displays. Here's a comparison with HTC Vive Pro. Now these are actual images taken with a camera through the lenses of both HTC Vive Pro and the VR1. As you can see, with our headset, all the buttons are crisp and everything in the inst instrument panel is fully readable. And you can see things clearly. Uh, for example, for car designers, this is a really useful tool for prototyping. Uh, this, can used, this can be used to skip many costly phases uh, in design iteration. For example, if we were an instrument designer, and we're doing a design review, and your review would look like the one uh, on, the, uh, on the left, you, that wouldn't be very useful for you. Here's another comparison image. This is from a flight simulator cockpit. As you can see, the other headsets wouldn't be of much help when trying to read the small print, uh, while with VR1, it's all quite clearly visible. Uh, Artists, by the way, take note, texture resolution is super important. Wherever the user might be looking at, it's going to need a lot of detail, usually as in form of texture resolution. Again, if you are a, if you are a pilot in training, trying to learn anything through the left, left image is not going to help you much. Uh, these headsets have a lot of professional use cases. We are working in industrial design, we're working with Volvo, Audi, BMW, and Volkswagen. And in training and simulation, uh, Airbus, Boeing, uh, Bohemia Interactive Simulations, and Saab. And then in architecture, engineering, and construction, uh, we, our partners are Foster Bus Partners, Selen, Siemens, and Trimble. We have also launched another headset that will be available later this year. It's a mixed reality developer device for engineers, researchers, and designers working on the realms of mixed reality. The human facing bits are identical to VR1, but in addition, it has two video see-through cameras and depth sensors, which allow a full-blown mixed reality experience. So this thing that we actually have here, it has two 12 megapixel cameras. Uh, from those, we feed 1K by 1K downscaled image to the host PC, plus a full resolution crop from the 
a direction the user is looking at using the gaze tracking that we have. The latency, photons to photons, is under 15 milliseconds. This means there is no perceivable lag. This 15, we say under 15 milliseconds because that is the worst case scenario because we are doing uh, scan line chasing. So we are actually streaming the image to the PC even before the DSP actually has done a full scan out of the frame yet. Here's some unmodified footage from XR1. This is a real storage building somewhere in the Bay Area. And this first section is something you could imagine seeing in a, say, HoloLens or Magic Leap. You can add things to your vision, but they look, well, a bit added on. With Vario, we control all the pixels. We can add black, we can, we can add any colors we want. By the way, you can go and see this very demo live in the Volvo booth at the Expo Hall. Of course, as we are also a VR headset, we can replace all the pixels if we so choose. And then it goes back, back to the real world. Uh, the video see-through has such a low latency that you can drive a car while wearing it. And in fact, that is exactly what Volvo has been doing. Again, on a closed road, don't even tr think of trying this at home and so on. But let's, let's see it. Um, XR1 opens up a lot of possibilities. In this case, for example, a designer would like to see how a new dashboard would look. And dashboard and interior design would affect usability. Previously, this, this would have meant going through very expensive prototype car building process. And now the designer can simply do tweaks inside Unity and see the results immediately. Volvo had a presentation on this uh, on Tuesday uh, of, of this and their adventures in XR using Unity. And there, I've heard there's going to be a YouTube video available of it later. Now let's, uh, take, let's take a look into how the applications actually render content for VR1. So this is how a typical VR display gets rendered. You, get, you have two views, one for each eye, and it's distorted a little bit to match the lens color and aberration, and uh, it provides an immersive view. This is all fine. With Vario, we're going to have to do a little bit more. We also have to render two focus displays. Uh, these images provide the high resolution 30 PPD, uh, 60 PPD image for the center area of the display. And the area of wide, uh, uh, field of view for these uh, focus displays is around 30 degrees, so it fits pretty nicely into what the, where the user is normally looking at. This is not free. It's essentially twice the draw calls, almost twice the pixels. So the GPU has a lot of work to do. So we have to draw our geometry into four separate views. Uh, so there are a few options. You can do the brute force approach, so just do four separate passes through your scene graph and uh, one for each view and just render everything four times. This works, but it's not the fastest solution. Uh, then there's single pass stereo in two passes where we do, uh, for example, in Unity you can do single pass stereo for uh, normal VR displays. So we do this single pass twice. Or then we just do one pass with four wide instance stereo rendering. And again, all the optimization tricks that apply to normal VR headsets still apply here. You don't need to do a separate culling pass for just for the focus display. You can reuse the same, same culling data. Um, we actually expose the option if you really want to do a separate culling for the focus displays, but I haven't yet seen any content where it would be helpful. Now let's look at how you can create content for Vario hardware using Unity. And I know this, this slide is a little bit like uh, preaching to the choir, but here are some reasons why our customers prefer to use Unity to create content. Uh, the first one is fast iteration cycle. Programmers and designers can easily work together. Uh, in fact, in the Volvo driving video I showed earlier, there was an engineer sitting in the back seat with a PC uh, running the MR simulation and actually <laughs> running Unity. So he could actually tweak things while sitting in the very car the designer was driving in, and the, the, the very car we were simulating. So that, that's fast iteration, if there ever was one. Uh, the Unity plugins are really quite 
straightforward to use. The asset store is a great selection of assets for quick prototyping. And this is why Unity is widely used by all our verticals. Uh, for Unity integration, we are offering two different options. The first one is the Unity plugin we'll be shipping with our SDK since uh, VR1. It's a custom solution, so it's a bunch of scripts plus a native, plugins that, uh, a native plugin that then submits those frames to the Vario compositor. Uh, it basically works so that we have a camera rig that contains four cameras and all of them render to a render texture and uh, then sends those frames to Unity. It's, uh, it's a brute force solution. It works with all the different renderers. It works with HDRP, Universal Render Pipe, and the Legacy Renderer. Uh, but it does a lot of extra work. There's no single pass stereo support in this one. And as I said, it doesn't use any of Unity's XR features. Uh, in fact, you'll have to disable Unity's uh, virtual reality supported checkbox if you want to use this plugin. And it's not really easy to switch between, say, Vario and Oculus and Vario and Steam VR inside a project. So the basic use it is, is not very difficult. You copy the plugin uh, folder into your assets folder and add Vario user prefab to your scene and, and you're done. That's it. You can hit play and you will see things in VR. Um, the Vario user prefab is the main camera rig for the VR scene. It contains a Vario manager component, which is actually one of Vario layers. Uh, you can add multiple layers in your scene, for example, for UI rendering, uh, by adding one or more Vario layer prefabs but you must have one Vario user in the scene, which is the main layer. And looking quickly at the settings, um, there are, most of them are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, face locked allows you to render content that is locked to the user's face as if it was parented to the camera. You cannot do this directly in VR because uh, space warp and time warp will try to compensate for it and it will look, it will look, look jittery. So with this one, you can have actually face-locked layers. We uh, support the uh, occlusion mesh, which renders the occlusion around the context display. Uh, the default material for the occlusion mesh just renders a black, uh, renders all black using uh, at the near plane of the camera so that the Z depth test will fail after that. If you're using a custom SRP that does something else, you'll probably need to replace that. But the default material just works out of the box. So if you leave it empty, it will use the default one. The second option for Unity integration is something we've been working on and we'll be releasing it as experimental later this year. Uh, it's a native integration with Unity's new XR architecture. It makes Vario a first-class citizen alongside other XR providers. Uh, you should definitely go see Mike Durand and Matt Fouad do a talk about the new XR architecture uh, in more detail today at 10.30. I think it's at the Expo Floor Theater. The plugin is installed through the package manager via a GitHub URL, and it will automatically pull in other dependencies. The, the new XR architecture in Unity is only available in 2019.3 onwards, so this plugin will not work on earlier versions. Uh, all the scriptable render pipelines need to be updated to be aware of Unity's new XR architecture. So right now it's HDRP only. Um, I've heard universal RP support is coming. And uh, with this plugin, we can use uh, two wide single pass stereo. And Fabian there is <laughs> promised to work on the four, four wide version as well. Its usage is pretty much exactly the same as you would with any other uh, new XR architecture plugin. So the same process applies to Oculus and Steam VR. You install the plugin via the package manager or the dialog over there. It will also pull in XR management package. Uh, oh, sorry, the, uh, first you install the Vario plugin uh, package from the package manager, which will pull in XR plugin management. Then you select the Vario VR loader in the project settings, and uh, you can add a new Vario loader there. Uh, you'll also need to install the XR input helpers because of the way the new input system works. And uh, then you'll also need to add a tracked pose driver to your camera. And then you're done. That then then uh, we're well, already done with all the XR setup, and you can just easily switch between, say, Vario and Oculus just by switching those loaders that you see, the order of the loaders you see there. 
looking at the plugin settings, we offer three rendering modes. The first one is a, what we call legacy, for lack of a better term. It's a backwards compatibility mode for render pipes that are not aware of the fact that somebody would be crazy enough to render it into four views at the same time. So in that mode, each eye is rendered into 4K by 4K texture, which is huge. And then the focus display, we just copy the middle part for, it focused, for the focus display. It does not offer full native resolution for the focus view, because that would require something like 5K by 7K texture, but it's, uh, it's a good compromise if nothing else works. Uh, Two-pass rendering uh, draws the context displays together in one single pass, and then the focus displays together in another pass. And there's a checkbox for choosing whether you want to reuse the culling results from the context display to the focus display, and typically that is what you want. Uh, there's also a submit depth button, a uh, checkbox there, which allows you to submit the depth map alongside the color, color buffers. This is useful for uh, if we had, want to do positional time warping, so it will improve the time warp quality, and also for all the mixed reality use cases. How does video see through mix into all of this? So, in order to achieve sub-15 millisecond latency, the video frames do not go through the application. They are handled directly in the compositor. And as I said, they are streamed in, so the actual finalized frame uh, only uh, arrives at the very end of the scanline. Uh, the compositor actually renders things in stripes, and we do scanline chasing. Uh, so the final VR image is composited from the application frames and the video feed based on depth comparisons and alpha blending. Uh, therefore, the Unity side API is quite simple. It's a simple function to start and stop video rendering. The application does have the ability to request the video frames as well as the IR camera feed and the depth map for the cameras, but they will arrive slightly late and they will not necessarily match what's getting rendered on the screen that very frame. Another nice feature is the ability to request a cube map that contains an estimation of the real world environment. Uh, Vario Runtime builds that estimation as the user moves around based on what it sees in the video feed. So let's look at the best practices and do's and don'ts when generating content for Vario headsets. Um, many post processing effects are not aware of the fact that there are multiple views or that those views are uh, positioned inside each other. For example, automatic exposure control sounds nice for VR as long as those exposure values happen to match between the context and focus views. It'll, it'll really look bad if, if they do not. And uh, then, um, uh, ideally, the exposure calculation would be done just based on the context view and then the focus display would just like follow suit but that's gonna need some tweaking to the post-processing stack. Uh, Bloom brings a lot of realism into the rendered image, but unfortunately, it also has some problems with foveated rendering. Each view is, again, processed separately, so the focus display will not be aware of a bright pixel right outside its edges, and then there's gonna be an edge there, and it breaks down the illusion. Lens dirt, just not a good idea for VR in general. Um, chromatic aberration and vignetting, just don't. They don't, they don't belong to VR to begin with. As I said earlier, uh, the high resolution of Vario VR1 sets quite stringent requirements for the content, especially when it comes to texture resolution. Uh, wherever the user might want to look at is going to need a lot of detail. Uh, you can either do it with extra texture resolution or by adding extra geometry if you feel like that. There's Another issue that can cause discontinuities across focus view edges. The engine selects the uh, LOD groups based on objects height on screen in relation to the screen height in pixels. So this calculation is done separately for the focus display and context display, so there might be cases where the context display gets a, a different LOD group than the other one. Uh, you can actually fix this yourself. Uh, you, can, you need to hook into, uh, depending on whether you, use, whether you are using the legacy renderer or an SRP. For legacy renderer, you can use the on a pre-call callback of a game object, and with SRPs, we can add ourselves into the begin camera rendering delegate. Either way, in that callback, we can check the current uh, camera viewport size and detect which view we are rendering into, and then adjust load bias accordingly. Let's talk about anti-aliasing. 
as a general rule of thumb, you shouldn't have to bother. Vario headsets are already rendering at resolution exceeding the sharpest human eyes in the focus displays. The default rendering resolution for the context display is 2K by 2K, the same as with all the other VR headsets because of the distortion correction, so it's 1.4 multiplier. Uh, because we want to prevent resampling artifacts when doing distortion correction. And this already gives you some super sampling benefits. So MSAA does work, it is supported, and you can use it if you want. You'll just be hard pressed to see any difference. In fact, MSA was accidentally broken for us for several months, and nobody noticed. So, uh, same kind of applies for F FXAA, SMA, and other ones. But temporal AA, on the other hand, I it can be used to tone down the shimmering of high-frequency signals, um, but of course it is quite expensive, uh, given the amount of pixels we're rendering each frame, and again, the anti-aliasing part is not exactly needed, again but you can use it and you feel to try it out if you, if you want. It does work as well. Let's look at one of the early demos we created for VR1 uh, with the International Space Station. The idea was to showcase how, how it feels for an astronaut to see the ISS, the Earth, the Moon, the stars in super clear detail. And some of the problems were pretty obvious early on. Uh, the ISS didn't have enough texture detail. Uh, Earth texture wasn't even close to what we needed. Uh, the star sky, a bit of the same thing. It was missing detail. The ISS model itself, 1.3 million polygons, seemed to be enough detail for our use case, but it came with no texture. So we just applied some generic uh, roughness maps uh, in there with metal, plastic, and so on. It was good enough. Uh, reflection probes, we used 256 across cube map resolution. Surprisingly, it's enough. Uh, the entire scene uses static lighting. To visualize this, on the left is what the context display sees with 90 degrees field of view. And on the right is the area that is shown, shown in the focus display. And you can see that anything on the screen that the user might look at is going to need a lot of detail to be realistic. The second problem was the Earth texture. Uh, the initial approach was to have an 8K texture for the Earth. Uh, it was nowhere close to be usable. It was just a blur. Uh, we ended, ended up using texture streaming and a virtual, virtual texturing with amplified texture from the asset store. Uh, the full texture was 86,000 pixels across. And even that was just barely sufficient just for the context display resolution. But uh, not, not, to, not to talk of the focus display resolution, but due to time constraints, we went that one, and in the end, it works sufficiently well. Uh, there's a separate shader used for the water areas, plus an extra 43K texture for the cloud cover. We added some procedural noise to, to make it look nicer. Uh, again, good enough. The night side texture was only 22K, and it was a bit too blurry, but it wasn't used much in the demo in the end, so all was well. Moon texture over here, 8K by 4K, that was good enough for focus display. Uh, for the stars, we used the excellent Milky Way panorama from ESA. That was by far the best available 360 image for, of our galaxy neighborhood. Uh, it st still was nowhere near the resolution we would need. Uh, we ended up actually using a dirty trick. We reapply that same panorama as a detail map just to get more stars in there. It, it's worked surprisingly well when viewed through the headset. Not sure how well this shows in this image, but this is the original, and with detail, we are reapplying the same map there. It actually passed a real-world NASA test. We showed this to a NASA engineer, and uh, he said, oh, I can see magnitude six level objects. This is the faintest object human eye can see, so I think we, we passed his test. Now it is time for a live demo. So what I'm gonna attempt here is to use Unity Editor to XR1 and it's video see-through. So we'll open up the Mario Home there so you can see. Okay, here we go. So you can see what the, what the headset is, is rendering. Hitting play here in Unity Editor. And here we are. 
say hi to the camera. So this is what you see here is the, uh, what the video see through renders to the images here. And I, as you can see, uh, the latency for me here is not perceivable. It is as if there was no lag. And the resolution is sharp enough so I can actually use Unity Editor. I am actually in the play mode now. What is being rendered is actually an Unity application in, running in the editor. So let's, this is right now, the scene is empty, there's nothing here. So let's add some game objects. And there's a Volvo. So um, what you can see here, this is actually a CAD model of a Volvo V40. Um, it has something like 37 million polygons, so it was kind of a heavy one. Uh, you, will see, you can see that the reflections here come uh, from the environment probe. So if I have my colleague coming over to the, to the screen, you can see that these reflections are actually real time. You can see his reflection in there. Yeah, that's good. All right, like that. So having, being able to work in Unity directly without actually having to leave the VR headset is super useful. Also, another thing is that we, this is still also a VR headset. We can replace all the pixels if we want to. So with a, this clicking here, we are suddenly in the book of the dead. So yeah, that's it for me, so thank you.